Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great privilege to honor Robert H. Bartlett, MD, FACS, a skilled surgeon, consummate investigator, charismatic teacher, and dedicated bioengineer who has played a key role in the development of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or ECMO, which provides respiratory and cardiac support to intensive care patients. A pioneer in this field, Dr. Bartlett was a key investigator of reliable membrane oxygenator technology, which involved into ECMO. His experience began in the lab and quickly was put into practice, starting with infants and progressing over many decades to extend in today's youth with pediatric and adult patients. Dr. Bartlett's significant research has been funded by 26 grants, including 14 from the National Institutes of Health. Today, as Professor Emeritus of Surgery at the University of Michigan Medical Center, he continues his work at the Cardiopulmonary Physiology and Extracorporeal Circulation Research Laboratory. He and his team are studying significant topics, including blood clotting and extracorporeal circulation, liquid ventilation, implantable lung devices, pulmonary fibrosis and acute lung injury, and many, many more techniques for prolonged extracorporeal circulation. Dr. Bartlett's team is also developing an artificial liver system for use in patients who are waiting for liver transplants. An influential leader, Dr. Bartlett has served as president on both the American Society for Artificial Internal Organs and the International Society for Artificial Organs. He is co-chair of the postgraduate course on fluids and electrolytes at the American College of Surgeons and is a key member of the pre- and post-operative care committee at the college. He is a recipient of the college's prestigious Sheen Award for Research, the, Jacobin Award, the Jacobson Award, and the I.S. Radvin Award for Lecture in Basic Sciences. Therefore, Mr. President, for his contribution to the development of life-extending technology and his unending drive to continue seeking new knowledge in the field, it is my honor to present Robert H. Bartlett for the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. Dr. Bartlett, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Thomas Jefferson University and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Science Honoris Causa, with all the rights, privileges, and honors to which it is entitled. In testimony of this, I present to you a diploma signed officially and bearing the seal of the university. I also ask that you be invested with the appropriate hood. Well, thank you so much, Chairman Binswanger, President Kozen, Dean Tikaczynski in the medical school is here uh, for this quite remarkable honor from this venerable and prestigious university that has such an important place in, in medical education and practice actually around the world. It's particularly meaningful to me because my research uh, career has been based in, in large part on the foundation built by John Gibbon, your probably most important, at least to me, alumnus over time, who uh, 60 years ago this month first used the heart-lung machine to care for a patient. Well, here's the day. 
Congratulations and thanks to all of the parents, the spouses, the aunts and uncles, the grandparents, the grandfather who paid for all this, thank you. <laughs> the grandmother, yes, good for you. And the grandmother who's out there who said, you go be a doctor, then play your violin. Congratulations and thanks to all of you on this stage. Please excuse my back. Uh, these are the people who taught these folks the skills and the knowledge and the wisdom and the technology which they will uh, carry forward into the world. Imagine the, the extent of information that all of you have passed into these students and how it will be magnified uh, hundreds, thousands of times over the next 50 years as they deal with patients and, and scientific problems. Uh, and congratulations to the folks who aren't here, those people who served as examples and inspiration. They don't even know it. The family doc, the high school soccer coach, the biology teacher, uh, the violin teacher who said, why don't you be a doctor? Instead of a <laughs> and Congratulations to you, the uh, soon-to-be graduates. We have a few minutes before the important stuff, so let's make rounds. <laughs> so we have only four patients on our service. This is Tom. He's a young man who's uh, two weeks post-motor vehicle accident, two days post-ICU. He has a rod on his femur. He has a tracheostomy. He has C5 quadriplegia. His temperature is 101. This is Sally, this little baby. She's two days old. She's still in the hospital because she has tachypnea. It turns out that we learned yesterday she has a large atrial septal defect. This is her mom, Katie, who is two days postpartum. She just had a massive pulmonary embolism. And this is Sam. He's a 65-year-old man with an irregular nodule in his left lower lobe. It looks pretty worrisome. He's on for a lobectomy on Monday, and our job this weekend is to buff up his diabetes and his anticoagulation. Now, making rounds, the med students know, is a pretty much purely medical activity. Uh, it involves doctors visiting their patients, either physically or mentally, at very regular intervals, several times a day in the hospital, and the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning and the last thing you do at night, and whenever there's a lull in daily activity, such as right now. So we, we go around and see, see these patients. It's making rounds is not just uh, a to-do list. It's rather a manifestation of this responsibility, which is unique to doctors. How are my patients doing for whom I'm responsible? That's the magic word. And, and what can I do? to take uh, better care of them. Now, I should tell you that making rounds with a surgeon can be unpleasant. Uh, surgeons, uh, by our training and nature, have to be confident, very confident, perhaps overconfident, because of what we do. But sometimes that spills over into a bit of arrogance, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, rounds are also a time for teaching. And uh, I re remember. A few weeks ago, a surgeon in our hospital was making teaching rounds with a group of medical students, and they came to the first bed, and, and the st student said, uh, sir, this is a Mr. Smith. He has a hernia. And the surgeon said, really? What is a hernia? Well, sir, a, a hernia is a protrusion of a normal viscous outside of its normal body cavity. The surgeon says, oh, yeah? Is this a hernia? Students, I, I really don't know. Oh, he's a dumb student. Is this a hernia? <laughs> Students said, no, that looks more like a hemorrhoid to me, sir. <laughs> well, if you have a mental picture of these patients that we're seeing on rounds today, uh, they seem to be quite diverse in age and gender and diagnosis and things like that, but it's actually quite similar to my usual practice. 
and despite the diversity, they have many things in common. Uh, each of these patients has an immediate medical problem which needs a, a solution, but each patient also presents a research problem which would take a lifetime to solve. How do you anastomose the spinal cord? Why do girls have ASDs and boys have pyloric stenosis? How does the endothelium prevent platelets from sticking to it and becoming activated? How do you repair the DNA of a malignant cancer cell? Well, the responsibility for answering those questions is that of you soon-to-be graduates of the School of Biomedical Sciences, and where are you? All spread out, or? Okay, oh, you're all together, that's great. So, your medical colleagues are barraged every day with these immediate medical problems. It never stops, it just goes on and on and on for years and years. You, on the other hand, get to pick one of those problems and spend your life trying to solve it. And, and that's a, a noble goal. Here at Jefferson, you've learned how to approach those scientific problems. You've learned how to support it with grants or industrial support. You've learned how to transmit your results to the world in the form of, of scientific papers. Uh, quite, a, quite a remarkable achievement that all these people have, have passed on to you. Now, as a practical surgeon, I advise you to pick that topic to be something that's actually going to solve a clinical problem in the next several years. The problem needs to be big enough to really pr answer a question, but small enough so you can do it in about 10 or 20 years. My suggestion to you from the, in the basic sciences is not proteomics or microRNA, it's organ banks. No one's ever been able to maintain a viable organ for more than a few hours. Imagine if we had warehouses full of hearts, lungs, livers, bone marrow, kidneys, how it would change all the way that we all practice. That's a good problem. Why don't you work on it? <laughs> so although these patients have immediate medical problems, uh, each one represents a practical societal and environmental issue that needs to be solved. Tom, is he a veteran? And why is that important? Who's Sally's father? We don't know. Uh, do you know that uh, Sam's wife smoked for 30 years? He never smoked. Is that important in his disease that he has? And who's gonna pay for this $10 million worth of care of just these four patients? Well, the responsibility for answering those questions goes to the soon-to-be graduates of the School of Population Health. Where are you? Oh, you're all up together. That's good. So you, you get to pick one of those problems and solve it, and your goal is to solve it in a lifetime or sometime sooner than that, if you can. And, and when you think about what the population health people do is how, how to prevent death when you get down to it and how to do it efficiently and, and to pay for it. So these four patients represent all the causes of death. Trauma, congenital anomalies, metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, infection. We're all going to die of infection at some time. So uh, your charge is to pick just one of those topics and focus on it and see if you can solve it. Jefferson has provided you with the knowledge to categorize the population, to determine the scientific and social variables that are involved, and uh, how you're gonna pay for all this sort of thing. Uh, as a surgeon, I hope you settle on a topic that really will address a major problem for my patients and the patients of your medical colleagues uh, and it needs to be big enough to do that, but small enough so you can really get it done in some, in some period of time. I advise you, graduates of population health, to focus on a major problem. It's not malaria or the water in Uganda. I would say trauma. 
the major cause of death of everybody under the age of 40. Now, all of these uh, patients that we're seeing have ties to John Gibbon, your illustrious alumnus uh, about whom we talked a little earlier today. He did the first successful operation with a heart-lung machine, which he had invented 60 years ago this month. And from that came the entire discipline of cardiac surgery, most of modern cardiology, most of modern intensive care, all based on, on his single contribution. 20 years before he did that case, he was a resident and was confronted with a young woman who had a massive pulmonary embolism and sat there through the night trying to keep her alive, doing everything he knew how to do, and staying right at her bedside, working on this patient. He didn't leave because some arbitrary number of hours had passed. He didn't try to hand off to some fellow resident who didn't know anything about that patient. Her life was his responsibility. That's, that's the word we're talking about. Through that long night, he thought, why can't we bypass this big clot in her pulmonary circulation by taking blood out of the venous side of the circulation and pumping it back into the aorta? Just one of those research questions that comes up with every patient that, that we all deal with. But he actually did something about it. He spent the next 20 years trying to answer that question. He was not a bioengineer, he was not a pharmacologist, he was not a physiologist per se, he was not an entrepreneur, he was just being a good doctor. Here's a patient with a problem, I'm gonna see if I can solve that problem. Well, he later went on to become chair of surgery in this prestigious institution and a worldwide leader in cardiothoracic surgery. And he would tell you he's just being a good doctor. And what does that mean, being a good doctor, for those of you in the about to be doctors here this, this morning? On my first day in medical school, which 50 years ago, the dean addressed the class and, uh, and said, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the medical school. Uh, the practice of medicine is 10% science and 90% grandmother. So much for the grandmother, we'll now spend four years on the science. And of course, that is what you've just done, worried about the science. Now, your basic science colleagues who are graduating today are going to keep working on that science, and they're going to solve the problems, and they're going to tell you clinicians when and how to use what they, what they learn in behalf of your patients. Take Sam's lung out, send it to the organ bank, they'll send you a new one, piece of cake. Your public health colleagues will continue working on the big picture, and thank God for that. Uh, they, they will address all these public health issues and population health issues that we're all, all faced with. In about 10 years, our United States healthcare economic system is going to adopt the Australian system. I tell you, it's perfect for the U.S. It would work great. And one of those guys back there is going to make that happen. Thanks to you. So these four patients that we're following need a good, need a good doctor. And, and uh, that's, that should be special to you. The most compassionate nurse, the most wise physiologist, uh, the most skillful PA, uh, the most efficient hospital administrator can do more than grandmother when presented these four patients. Jefferson has prepared you for that responsibility, and I, I'm sure you'll take it very seriously. Well, making rounds also involves prioritizing that responsibility, and I'm sure that some of you are thinking, Tom needs a white count, or uh, Sam needs a media stenoscopy, but several of you are thinking, this girl got a massive pulmonary embolism. Why are we sitting here? This guy's carrying on while she's dying of a pulmonary embolism. Well, good for you. I want you to be my doctor because there are times when definitive action trumps contemplative conversation. In a few minutes, uh, you and all the doctors in the hall here will recite the Hippocratic Oath. 
And, and it's, it's quite a wonderful thing. Uh, you will do it many times in your lifetime. It's interesting to point out that the science that Hippocrates was writing about was all wrong. Even the modern version, which you're going to read, the science is way outdated. But there's nothing in there about science. It's about responsibility and humility and compassion and integrity. So it really boils, while you're reading this ancient bit of, of advice to doctors, just think about what it means is, I promise myself to be a really good doctor. Dr. Gibbon would be proud of you. Thank you very much. <laughs>